back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Trial Network. I'll be your host for this afternoon, Rachel Stockman. And boy, do we have a lot going on here on the Law and Crime Trial Network. We had a guilty plea in that Uber driving case that we were following out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. And we were just inside opening statements from the defense in the McStay family murder case out of California. Literally, just minutes ago, the defense wrapped up their opening statement. We're working to turn around the last bit of that opening statement that I know you missed because, unfortunately, we had to take a break, but we're going to bring it to you. Before we do, though, in case you did miss some of it, let's play a bit of the defense's opening statement. This is critical. Take a listen. All right, so you're hearing just a bit of the defense's opening statement here. And I have to say, I think they did a pretty good job. We're going to work to cut up the rest of it and bring it to you just in case you missed it, especially that end part. I want to bring in Misty Maris, a fellow law and crime host, um, and uh, she's a frequent commenter on the Law and Crime Network as well. Let's talk really briefly uh, about this before we get to some more clips of it, but about this defense opening. I thought it was pretty strong and makes some pretty good points. Absolutely. And I, I think there's such a strong focus on what the process, uh, what police in this investigation did not find. And that's where you heard the defense attorney going, that there could have been other evidence that was never pursued because the police investigators had their eye on the defendant. It's a defense we've heard before, but it was very well laid out here. And this last comment that we just heard in this clip is a really big question mark to put in the jury's mind. Why? Who? Who is the person that wanted to see an entire family disappear? When in this particular case, the uh, the issue between the defendant and Mr. McStay had nothing to do with his family. It was direct. Right. We have perhaps motive, uh, uh, motive for him wanting to take out Joseph McStay because he was going to be terminated from his job. But this was a really brutal crime against a whole family, children, young children involved. There has to be a lot of hate. There has to be a real reason for someone want to want to do something like this. Right. And that's where the defense attorney was planting that seed in the jury's mind, thinking the jury should keep that in mind as evidence begins to unfold. Could financial issues really be the, the precipice of such a brutal crime against an entire family. And that's where the defense attorney is going. They're saying, hey, something doesn't make sense with respect to motive here. And guess what? Investigators didn't really work too hard to try and find other potential people who could be uh, who could be culpable. So that's where you see the defense going, really laying the framework for the holes that they're going to poke in the prosecution's case. And again, as I mentioned, um, we, you know, are working to turn around some more of that sound in case you missed the defense's opening statement, because we kind of have an, had an idea of where the prosecution was going with this case. But in like many criminal cases, the defense had st stayed rather tight lipped in terms of, you know, where they're going to take this. And I think if they can prove, and it seems like they had really specifically named witnesses, DNA, forensics, that they were going to point to Misty to try to prove that this guy, Charles Merritt, was not the one who did this. Yes, Rachel, and you bring up such a great point because oftentimes in a defense opening statement, you don't get all of that information right out the gate. And there's a strategic reason for that. The defense attorney wants to assess whether or not those witnesses are going to be helpful, whether or not that evidence is something they want to introduce as the trial goes on and they see what the prosecution's case really is. Now, once a defense attorney puts that all out on the table, they better deliver throughout the trial because jurors will wonder, why did you identify that witness and then we never heard from them? Well, this is going to be a fascinating case. We have a crew in California. I'm told that they're on about an hour and a half lunch break between 3 and 4.30 Eastern time uh, for, here, for us here in New York City. Um, but when we have that stream back for you live, we will bring it to you. In the meantime, I want us to continue to play some of the defense's opening in case you missed it. Take a look. All right, so you're just listening some more of the defense's 
uh, opening statement there. Really quickly, quick throw it to you, Misty, before we have to take a break. Right. Uh, this is, again, what we heard before. The defense uh, really focused on the fact that the motivation the prosecution has presented is financial, saying something just really doesn't sit right with this crime, and also talking about forensic accountants, other uh, types of witnesses that we can anticipate hearing when the defense puts on their case. They're pretty specific. So if the defense attorney was pretty specific in his opening. So if they don't deliver, uh, that could be a problem for them. Absolutely. They almost have to. Once you start naming these specific people, these specific witnesses, juries will be very suspicious if they don't hear from the witnesses that were promised. That's why a defense attorney takes a risk putting that all out there in the opening as opposed to tailoring how they want to present their case to what the prosecution has. Because remember, it's the prosecution's burden. Sometimes a defense attorney will opt not to put on a case at all. Now we can really anticipate that we're going to see quite a few witnesses on the defense side. And right now we're showing a shot, or we were, of Charles Merritt, the defendant in all of this. And especially when this case first started, it was really interesting to watch him because he had his there he is. Uh, this is him listening to tests, uh, listening to some of the openings. But when he walked in, he had his stack uh, of paperwork. At first, I didn't even realize it was the defendant because I thought he was one of the attorneys. Yeah, he was coming in. He had all of his paperwork looking prepared for the day. We heard the defense attorney uh, talk about how he does have degrees. He has an expertise in technology. He understands how cell phone towers work. Perhaps he's been a really active part of the defense strategy. All right. Well, we're going to continue to uh, very closely monitor what's going on in the McStay family murder case out of California. We have a crew on on the ground. We're going to take you there live just as soon as it starts back up. But for now, we're going to take a quick break here on Long Cry. All right, so I want to bring in Misty Maris, our long crime trial host and analyst here. Uh, where do you think this is effective strategy by the defense right now? It's really interesting because many times the defense just put on their opening statement to go outside to the courthouse steps in a case like this is really unusual. Now, Very. We, absolutely, shocked. because you take risks anytime you put something out into the public sphere when you're talking about defending your tri uh, client at trial, you're taking a risk. All I can think is that they've identified, they've said there's other people the police should have looked into, but did not. And perhaps they think by bringing the public into this, they'll be putting pressure on the police department to actually investigate some of those people. Well, we'll see if that happens. Again, you know, with the prosecutor spending this much time pointing the finger at Charles Merritt, uh, going to trial, spending months and months and months of preparation for them to suddenly reassess who they think is the murderer in this case seems, Misty, very unlikely to me. Um, but we'll see what comes out in terms of evidence from the defense. Again, this is expected to be a three or four month long case. So we might not hear the defense's full side for another month or so while the prosecution goes through all of the evidence. So it's our opportunity now to hear at least from the defense uh, in the opening statement. So let's continue to listen to more of those. This happened just, I'd say, about 25 minutes ago. Take a listen. Okay, so the defense attorney in this clip really talking about the issue of confirmation bias. I want to turn to now to Misty to discuss exactly what that means. So what confirmation bias means, and it's not surprising that given what we know about the defense's theme of the case, botched investigation, that this is where they're going, it means that any new fact, any new piece of evidence that law enforcement receives, they treat as a confirmation of an existing belief. So layman's terms, it means that anything that, the, that they found, any fact, any piece of evidence, all went towards trying to prove that Merritt, Merritt was the killer in this case without looking at what other paths that fact or piece of information might have led to, i.e. another person, another potential culprit. So it's almost like having tunnel vision. Yeah, it's, it's like having tunnel vision, putting the blinders on. It's that our entire case is focused on evidence against Merritt. And when we see something that doesn't comport with that, we're not following up on it. We're not looking to see if there's somebody else who could be, be foul play in this situation.
Yeah, I mean, that. but again, we're going to have to see where the evidence leads because it's easy for the defense attorneys to say that. But we haven't seen the prosecution present all of the evidence. It seemed like in that clip they were also trying to hedge a prosecution's argument saying, well, he was talking about the family in past tense, therefore he must have murdered them. Um, but, okay, let's, before we continue our conversation on that, let's continue to listen to a bit more of the defense's opening. Take a listen. All right, and we're in a brief break in the McStay family murders trial. That was just a clip you were hearing of the defense's opening. Um, we're going to continue to follow that case. We're also getting some of the prosecution's opening turned around in case you missed that from earlier where we were having some feed issues with that. Um, but I do want to bring in Aaron Keller right now, the host of the Daily Debrief. He's standing by in the newsroom and he's going to tell us what he has in store for his show. Aaron. Rachel, good to see you. Of course, by standing by, we literally mean standing here today. But coming up at 5 o'clock on what's probably going to be a special edition of the Daily Debrief, we're continuing to follow the McStay family murder trial there in California. Of course, that is Pacific time. We're here on the East Coast. So testimony is likely going to bleed into the evening. We will endeavor to in carry as much of it as possible on the debrief. Plus, actor Kevin Spacey, those pictures he didn't want you to see, well, we have them. Remember, folks, he tried to avoid appearing in court on Nantucket Island off the coast of Massachusetts on charges he groped an 18-year-old at a restaurant bar late one evening in 2016. Well, there he is in court. He couldn't get out of it. We have the pictures. We have the hearing. We will break that down on the debrief, assuming no live testimony in the McStay case. Also, a surprise guilty plea in that Michigan case against an Uber driver who claimed that the devil took over his body and his mind and forced him to kill six people. You'll listen to his words for the judge now that he has to speak. We're going to bring that to you as well. Again, assuming nothing huge is happening in the McStay case, that's the big wild card. So anything could happen on the Daily Debrief coming up tonight at 5 o'clock Eastern. I know we'll see you there too, Rachel. And Aaron, if we are still live in McStay, we're going to be carrying it live here on the network, and you're going to be here till the minute it ends, carrying it all the way through the evening, in right? the evening. And into late in the evening. We're not sure. You never know with these live trials, and we're prepared to bring it to you here on Long Crime. Okay, thanks so much, Aaron. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more live coverage. Stay with us. So answer me this, Misty Maris. Why would the defense attorney want to show the autopsy photos, given how brutal the nature of the crime was? Wouldn't that work against him? Yeah, usually, especially when you do have that type of brutal death, a lot of times the defense wants to keep those photos out in their entirety because right. they don't want it to shock the jury. They don't want the jury to have preconceived notions. But it seems like this defense attorney has a very different strategy, and it's really getting out ahead mm -hmm. of what he intends the prosecution's evidence to be. So those things, while might while they might not be uh, so beneficial to the defendant, he's saying, hey, look, these are these autopsy photos. This is blunt force trauma. It's a terrible picture. But... It's going to be important to the defense case. Get out ahead of it. You're going to see this from the prosecution. Yeah, and we'll see because the prosecution is going to start their case in about four, 50 minutes' time, and we expect to bring it live here on the Long Crime Network. We're going to continue our review of more of the defense's opening statements that just wrapped up a few minutes ago. So the defense attorney makes a pretty good point. Going through the autopsy, there is... Uh, no doubt how this family was murdered. They were bludgeoned to death, blunt force trauma to the head, just a brutal death. So the question the defense attorney is ask, asking is, if that is true, how is it possible that no blood was found at the alleged murder scene? Misty, I think that's a pretty good point. Absolutely, of course. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the reasons why talking about those autopsy photos has so much meaning once you put it together with that other piece, what was found at the crime scene. Being bludgeoned, what was it, 30 times, uh, obviously is going to create blood, DNA. This would be everywhere in the house. And the, the defense attorney is making the point, again, undercutting what he believes the prosecution is going to try and show, that these murders maybe didn't take place at the house. Again, raising reasonable doubt. Yeah, and I think it's pretty effective. But again, 
We're going to have to see what the evidence shows. Uh, perhaps they have a theory of how this was all cleaned up to ensure that no blood evidence was found at the scene. But given the tools that were used, and I'm looking at my notes right now to see what the uh, uh, exact beaten to death, blunt force trauma to the he head, um, and where they were found in these shallow graves, the fact that at this alleged murder scene there is little blood evidence is probably pretty troubling for the prosecution. Absolutely, and you're going to see the defense focus on those facts because, again, we know the defense theory of the case, that there was other evidence the police could have followed up on, there were other facts, there were other people they could have looked at, and they didn't. So what they want to say is the prosecution has this wrong. And that's where the defense is going in this case. And by the way, the defense is also went so far as to say that they have viable other suspects that they believe point to committing the murder against this family of four. And the police didn't look into these people. And you can bet during the course of the trial, they're going to try to point the finger at these other suspects. I mean, if, they, if they're putting it out there that they have these other viable suspects, they got to do that. Definitely. And as a defense attorney, you can present alternative theories. Absolutely. And if you have people... The jury might have a question mark in their mind because it's That's reasonable even better. doubt. If you have, if you not only have reasonable doubt that this person committed the crime, but you can then point the finger at another suspect and show evidence that someone else did it, that's good for the defense. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to try to, we're getting the feed in right now, and we're going to try to bring you a replay of the prosecution's openings, which we missed due to some audio issues that were beyond our control, but we're working on that right now. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, so what the defense is trying to say here is that if Charles Merritt murdered the family in that home, a family of four bludgeoned them to death with a blunt object, how did the blood not end up in all that trash that was all around the room? And if it did, it would have been thrown away. And, and Misty, what do you make of what he just said? Uh, I think he makes a really great point because it's going to be hard to argue that somebody who came in bludgeoned someone to death. There would obviously be blood. There would obviously be DNA. There would obviously be something there selectively cleaned to the room only cleaned the blood didn't it didn't hit any of this other debris that was on the floor it's just not believable and i can only imagine that they're going to have blood spatter experts to do yes. Yes. <laughs> that, you know there i hate laughing on something so brutal but it's just kind of somewhat predictable that are they're they're going to come in and say if someone was murdered the way that the prosecution the medical examiner say this family was murdered that blood would be everywhere in the house right and then you're also going to see the prosecution though have crime scene experts sometimes you'll have somebody come in and actually uh, almost reenact the way the crime could have happened for the jury a crime scene expert so it's what we see very often in these types of cases battle of the experts now here you see and this is one of the reasons why the defense is so focused on this because they want to undercut the prosecution's case the defense is saying and they actually had a you know a powerpoint where this was written in big words circumstantial evidence that there really isn't, uh, according to what we've heard now in the opening, there really isn't this hard evidence that's going to link merit to these murders. And they're cutting it down every step of the way in the opening. And Rachel, you made a good point. We were talking off camera. The question is, will they deliver? Will the defense actually deliver what they're promising in the opening? Yeah, and, and one of the other interesting things, and I, I want to continue reviewing the testimony also, is, you know, the, the defense is trying to say the prosecution and, and police really botched this case. And at first they were thinking that this was a, a disappearance case. And they all, police actually believe they had surveillance video of the family leaving and going to Mexico. I think somewhere we have that surveillance video. I'm sure it will come up in court. But the point is, you know, the defense is saying they totally did not know what they were doing with this investigation to begin with. It went years and years and years with anybody, without anyone discovering these bodies. So how can we take them seriously that they now suddenly have the right person if they botched this investigation for so long? Okay, so let's continue to watch more of the defense's closings. Take a listen. 
Okay, so he's going over that same point from earlier, showing even more of the house where this family was allegedly murdered, showing all that junk, um, the clothes that were all around the house, saying, wait a second here, someone bludgeoned to death in this house? How can that possibly be? Right. Wouldn't there be something? Their bodies were ultimately removed at some point. There would have to be some trace of evidence uh, in such a brutal murder, which, again, is why there was some focus on the autopsy photos and then the crime scene photos. And you're right. It doesn't add up, at least from what we're seeing right now from the defense perspective. And that's what they're trying to get into the jury's mind. And I'm going to ask our producer quickly, do we have that surveillance video when they were uh, allegedly fleeing? Okay, we don't have it. We'll get it ready. But when they were fleeing, when police thought they'd identified them fleeing to Mexico. Right. And this really fits in with the defense narrative because they're saying, all right, police treated this case like a missing persons case. They didn't treat it like a murder investigation where they're looking for suspects, they're looking for foul play. And because of that, police didn't obtain evidence at the time, the, in closer in time to when this happened. I mean, the bodies were discovered, what was it, three, three years, years later. later. So obviously, it's more difficult to find evidence and to really find out what happened the more time has passed. It's more difficult to collect that. So this is all fitting in to the narrative. And Rachel, you're going to see that video uh, that, that was of the fleeing to Mexico and Alleged, all of that. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of evidence, we're going to see more from the prosecution what they have. But we know they have truck marks, and Merritt's DNA was found on the steering wheel and gear shift handle of the McStay's vehicle that was found parked near the Mexico border. But the defense is saying that was just a trace, trace amount and could have been earlier in the day. They knew each other. He had been in the vehicle before. So it's going to be interesting to see what exactly, let's write it down, the key pieces of evidence the prosecution actually has and how does the defense rebut that that's what we should be watching out for because so far i haven't seen a whole lot of evidence from the prosecution we have to take a quick break when we come back we'll have more inside this case in california stay with us All right, we'll continue to play more of the previously recorded opening statements from the prosecution from earlier today. But I think that gave you a pretty good sense of where the prosecution is going with the case. And they really highlighted this interview that Charles Merritt did a few days after the disappearance of the McStay family in which he repeat, repeatedly used the past tense. But we now know from listening to the defense's openings that they have a rebuttal to this, this kind of damning evidence against Charles Merritt. Right. The defense came out and said, uh, basically hit, hit it right at the outset and said that the reason the defendant answered those questions in the past tense was because the questions were actually being asked in the past tense. So they're getting ahead of that issue. Obviously, from a prosecution, prosecutorial perspective, it's two days after they've disappeared. This is the first interview, and every response is in the past tense. Of course, that's going to send up red flags. The defense intends on rebutting it. Now, Rachel, an interesting thing about that, we heard in the interview tape that uh, the defendant actually, in that interview, tried to qualify why he was responding in past tense. But otherwise, outside of the opening statement, unless he were to actually take the stand and testify, there's really no other way for the defendant himself to explain away what was going on in his mind during that questioning. Well, the defense attorney is trying to say the questions, like you said, were, were said in a past tense form. Therefore, he answered it in a past tense form. But regardless, it is a bit strange that here you have a missing persons case that's not even but a few days old, and you have this guy talking about this family like they're dead. And as far as we know, the prosecution, the police had no indication that the family was dead. In fact, they didn't think the family was dead for years and years. They thought, thought the family had fled to Mexico. Right. The, the police in the initial investigation treated it like a missing person's case, as we said before. Uh, and you're right. And I think, Rachel, some of those statements in that interview, he was my best friend. He loved his wife. The children were energetic. Well, yeah. Well, now you this is this is what a trial is, right? The jury hears that. They decide whether or not 
that is something that's going to speak to his guilt, or if the defense explained it away adequately. But see, here's the thing, and we're going to continue to listen to more of the prosecutions when we get them later. Right now, the reason we had to cut out of that is we're waiting for live court to begin in California, so we'll bring that to you live. But but here's the thing. I always feel like when the pro pro prosecution is trying to parse words like that in a police interview as part of, you know, a key part of their opening statements, that raises a red flag to me that, wait a second, maybe they don't have a ton of ton to go on. Because if they're trying to say, hey, isn't it weird he referred to her in the past? Yeah, that could be part of their case. But if that's a key thing they're honing in on in the opening statements, that leaves me to wonder uh, what else they have. Right. And Rachel, you that's a great point and, and something we also saw the defense really identify in a slide put up on the board, circumstantial evidence. So now from a prosecutorial perspective, unless you really have solid direct evidence, which we anticipate in this case, there's not too much DNA evidence here, uh, that they're going to have to paint this picture. They're going to have to put the story together. So we heard some of the prosecutor's major points. We heard about financial issues, stolen checks, cell phone being off the grid, and then a, a lot of emph emphasis on this police interview. Now, something else that came up was the fact that uh, prosecutors are saying that the defendant actually interesting to see what that really means as more testimony is unveiled throughout the trial. It certainly will. We have to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. As I mentioned before, we're waiting for the trial to begin live. It's expected in just minutes. So stay with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Today, 59-year-old Hollywood actor Kevin Spacey was brought out in front of a judge to face charges of indecent assault and battery, a felony charge that could come with up to five years in prison. He entered a not guilty plea. Let's take a quick look at some of the charges and the facts he's facing. Take a listen whose roles won him Academy Awards for the usual suspects in American Beauty and a Golden Globe for House of Cards is now an accused criminal. The case unfolded when Spacey went to a crowded Nantucket restaurant and bar where an 18-year-old busboy was at work. Court records say the busboy lied to Spacey, saying he was 23 years old. After the busboy's shift ended at midnight, Spacey bought him a beer and another. Spacey said, let's get drunk. Spacey or his manager bought the busboy four or five beers and four or five glasses of whiskey, according to documents. The busboy says his memory is fuzzy, but he remembers a drunken sing-along with Spacey's arm around him. Spacey commented on the length of his own penis, according to court records. Later, the two went outside for a cigarette. Spacey asked the busboy to come home with him to meet Spacey's friends. The busboy says he became nervous. They went back inside where Spacey is accused of putting his hand on the busboy's thigh, unzipping his pants, and touching him sexually. It went on for about three minutes. The busboy took a Snapchat video of the incident and sent it to his girlfriend, then went to the bathroom, then told a woman Spacey was trying to, quote, rape him. She advised him to leave, so he did. The busboy told police he didn't know how to react in the moment because he feared getting in trouble. The summer 2016 incident became public in the fall of 2017 when former Boston TV news anchor Unruh announced the busboy as her son. She dug into the case herself and tried to round up witnesses. Police got involved a few weeks later. When prosecutors filed the charges, Spacey released a cryptic video in the character of Frank from House of Cards, which some believe to be a response. But you wouldn't believe the worst without evidence, would you? You wouldn't rush to judgments without facts, would you? Did you? Spacey is charged with indecent assault and battery on a person over 14 without consent. He could face five years in prison and could be forced to register as a sex offender if convicted. I'm Rachel Stockman for the Law and Crime Network. And Kevin Spacey entered a not guilty plea during his arraignment today. I want to bring in my guest for the afternoon, Misty Maris. Taking a look at that video that he released December 24th on the day the charges were announced of him in the character of Frank. 
Uh, I mean, I was in complete disbelief when I saw this. Oh, me too. I mean, it's very, it seems to be very clearly a response to, to these allegations. And it's interesting that that's the method he chose to try and address them in his, you know, world famous House of Cards character. Uh, again, I mean, from a defense, you always tell your, tell your client in any case, if you see charges coming, if you see a civil case coming, anything. Stay off the internet. Don't put any statements out there. Uh, but you know, can't always control yeah, the way people I react. I have a guess that one of two things happened in this. Either he did not tell his defense attorney he was doing this, or he told his defense attorney. His defense attorney said, "You're crazy. No way." And he did it anyway. But I can't imagine any defense attorney that's worth any money would allow, uh, even from a PR perspective, even if it's not something that they can bring into court. Uh, allowed him to do something like this. Right. I mean, I think also the response to do it in character, to talk about it in that way, it also diminishes the seriousness of the accusation, which is certainly Even a problem. Even if it's not true. Even if it's not true, but it's so certainly serious. So let's take a, a look at what happened in court today. All right, so that was the defense making a motion there during the arraignment to preserve the text messages between the alleged victim and Kevin Spacey from the time of the incident, the alleged incident, for six months after. So we saw him, he's entering a not guilty plea, but what's significant about that? Because the defense is trying to say that these could be exculpatory text messages. In other words, they could exonerate Kevin Spacey from this. What could they possibly say in these text messages? Well, we won't know. It's a very reasonable request on behalf of the defense, because right. again, they're talking about preservation of data, which is going to be important uh, as potential evidence of the trial. But Rachel, the only thing I can think of is that somewhere in those communications, there's something that the defense believes will uh, help them in showing consent. Because whenever you have a sexual assault, a case involving sexual contact, the key component is, did the contact occur, right, by the person that it's alleged? And the second component, if the contact did occur, is was the contact consensual? So who knows what types of conversations they had after the fact. Obviously, the prosecution's case focuses on those contemporaneous uh, communications that night. But we don't know what's out there from the defense perspective. Clearly, they think that there is something that needs to be preserved to that could be exculpatory. And this is really a fascinating case because at first, Kevin Spacey actually tried to argue that he wouldn't have to appear in court uh, for this arraignment, which I, I, that's kind of absurd for a criminal case not to be have to appear yourself. Right. I actually this had to. a traffic ticket or a civil case. <laughs> no. I had to go back and rack my brain. Because like it, I mean, is this really? I, I don't. I don't know of any situation where that's been granted outside of something that would cause you know sheer mayhem or something like that. There would have to be really extreme circumstances. I mean, good, good attempt by the defense, I say, but it's almost kind of insulting that Kevin Spacey, because he's some Hollywood actor, would think he can be waived from something that every single criminal defendant, whether guilty is charged or not guilty is charged, has to do. Um, okay, so we have to take a quick break here on Law and Crime. We're going to move on from the Kevin Spacey case, keep an eye on it. In the meantime, we're expected to feed back in California for the Charles Merritt case. That's the McStay family murders case. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Okay, so the defense attorney making some interesting points in the McStay family murders trial that we're following out of California. Unfortunately, we have to take a quick break here on Law and Crime. But when we return, we'll take you back inside that courtroom and bring you the remainder of the opening statements from the defense. Stay with us here on Law and Crime.